You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Annie Laurie Gaylor on women's liberation from religion. We'll also be talking about secret deals between the UK government and the Saudis, Jill boobs and fatwas against them, a wonderful Syrian rock band uh, called State Bread, that held an impromptu rock concert during flight, as well as some interesting news from Iran, including men standing up for women's equality and the commuted death sentence of Sohail Arabi. Don't go away. Well, with news of the week that passed, we've got lots to talk about. One is about news that's come out regarding a vote trade between the UK government and the Saudis to get them both elected to the UN Human Rights Council. The relationship between government, it's, it's fine, but secret deals to get you, uh, you, um, Saudi Arabia on human rights, that's disgraceful. I mean, sometimes you, see, you hear uh, governments express concern about human rights. This seems to be just to keep the public sort of uh, busy and they carry on with the secret deals. So I think British government is complicit with the Saudi Arabia on violation of human rights. Yeah, and also there's uh, other information uh, on how the uh, Foreign Office and Home Office have been working to help with Saudi's policing. I mean, helping with the policing of a uh, repressive regime as, uh, as repressive as Saudi Arabia is atrocious and you know the good thing is that some of this relationship is being highlighted more and more and there's pressure on this uh, but again the the UK government has close relations with the Iranian regime yes. and that too is something that doesn't come under enough scrutiny. I think there's clearly there are a lot of deals, uh, secret deals, um, that they need to be exposed and effectively they maintain these dictator dictatorial regimes. Yeah. Maybe if we've heard about the uh, news, I mean, the, on, on the other hand, we have the pressure from within the Iranian society trying to, um, you know, fight against the, um, you know, dictatorial Islamic regime in Iran. Yeah, I mean, the good news is there's this campaign um, where men are coming out and defending gender equality. And it's in response to the husband of the women's Iranian football team because he refused to allow her to, she, she was the captain of the team, to go to Malaysia to play. Uh, and the team won actually there. And so in response to the fact that he's allowed not to give her permission to travel, men have come out and said, we give our wives permission to travel, we give them all their full rights back, even though the regime has taken it away from them. That's, you know, that's the pressure that it's working uh, and it's important to highlight these uh, situation that the, in, in Iranian society there is a huge anti-government, anti-Islamic backlash in the Iran and opposes all these changes. Yeah, and I think one of the other things which is thanks to pressure is that these death sentence of Sohail Arabi, uh, a young man in his 30s who was given the death penalty for insulting Muhammad Islam's prophet and insulting uh, the Iranian regime's supreme spiritual leader. His sentence has been commuted from the death penalty to uh, two years of theological study. He has to read 13 religious texts and report back to the regime on his uh, you know, on his understanding of those texts, but he still has a seven and a half year sentence for um, insulting Khamenei. Which is a crime in Iran to criticize the, the, um, the big dictator in Iran. Yeah. The Indonesian Olama Council, which is the highest body of the top dog, Mullah, sitting there making rules on everybody, for everybody and everybody's lives, and of course, most often they're not for women, they're really angry, and it's because they're women who are wearing the scarf, the headscarf, which they call jilbab there, but they're dressed, you know, with their body showing, wearing like tight-fitting clothes, person. like anybody else, and it's being dubbed jilbub, and they are 
angry about it. They're really angry. And this is, this is we're trying to sort of cover everybody in, in Islamic dress and people are resisting and that's part of a resistance of young people. So they say, let's just go away. And social media is full of sort of photographs and sort of uh, short videos of young people who are, um, you know, not agreeing with the, um, with the fatwa. Mm. And what's funny is that they've said that, oh, there's already a uh, fatwa against pornography, as if, you know, a woman who's not wearing a tent or a body bag is pornographic because they hate women's bodies so much. Uh, but they're saying that, and it's really good that you've elected to wear the jilbab, but don't be vulgar, you know. And it's interesting how for them, a woman's body is so vulgar, you know, it's complete vulgarity. So... I mean, this is the beginning of end of the Islamic dress. You know, these, you know they've, they're not respecting the complete cover, and I think this is a beginning for, um, you know, to get rid of the whole thing. Yeah. So Jill boobs are good, but no Jill bobs are better than anything else. And of course, no ulama talking and issuing fatwas and, you know, making people's lives hell. Khebez Dola, or State Bread, is a Syrian rock group, and they were forced to flee Syria when their drummer was killed, and when they said that there was no more place for music in Syria, a Syria that they say is controlled and run by war criminals. Now, in, in the process of their flight, they actually set up an impromptu rock concert, and it is just, I mean, when I watched this, um, it's from Al Jazeera. It just made me have goosebumps all over. I mean, you you, you get those many times. Yeah, I do. That's true. <laughs> do. Yeah. But I think this is this is the human face of the people fleeing war, mm. and you know, Islamist um, and the uh, and the um, Syrian government. The hell that has been created for them, and this is this shows the human face of the refugees and the reason why people are. Fleeing, and you know, you could see that, and, and people need to recognize and, and support it. Yeah, so watch this short video clip uh, from Al Jazeera on this, uh, this, this wonderful slice of life. Uh, really, you're, it's just goosebump worthy completely. Five Syrian musicians, we came uh, from a beautiful country uh, governed and controlled by war criminals. So it was surreal for us and for them. Uh, and uh, we wanted to make it more surreal, so we, we whipped out these copies of the CDs from the, the bags and we, we started distributing the CDs on the beach. We just bought a guitar in Athens to play on the, on the road because we, we just basically cannot uh, stay like more than three days without playing or that jamming. <laughs> We've got a wonderful interview with Annie Laurie Gaylor, and she's the co-founder of Freedom From Religion Foundation. She's also got a long history in defending women's rights, their access to reproductive health. She's written a couple of books. And I just find her so fascinating because she says the most wonderful things in the most softly and gentle, gentle way. And you just feel mesmerized by her. I felt I couldn't stop staring at her during the interview. I know, but the, the logic is powerful. The I mean, logic that, that, that's, is so powerful. That, that's great. And when you see the link between the history of women's uh, liberation, women's right movement in the United States, which has a brilliant history, uh, again, it's religious right, um, and you link that and you compare it with the current uh, women's liberation in Middle East uh, and North Africa, you'll see the links, you see the history, you see the, how that's developing and the linking of these two, I think, is just 
great to see. Yeah. Well, watch this interview and then we'll come back to discuss it further. Stay with us. Thank you for joining us. I wanted uh, to speak to you about the work you've done on women's rights. If you can first talk about what is fundamentally wrong with religion and the question of women. The Bible um, and the Quran are handbooks for the subjugation of women. Um, they lay all the blame um, for evil and sin on women and in the New Testament um, it demands that women be subservient and be in silence and we um, know the role of the Quran in oppressing women and um, we have we need a women's revolution from religion because it's the principal enemy of women's rights um, it sanctifies the idea that women are inferior and sinful and um, we uh, cannot uh, move forward while um, people uh, believe literally in the Bible or the Quran. But um, I suppose people will say that uh, some women find religion quite liberating. Uh, well, I think people can believe whatever they like, but we can look at the damage that religion causes women worldwide. Um, for example, uh, reproductive rights in the United States. It's the organized religion, Catholicism, and the fundamentalists that are trying to take away not just abortion rights, which is a right that we won years ago, but the right to contraception. Uh, if you cannot control your own body and your own fertility, you can't control anything about your life. And Margaret Sanger you know, said women cannot be free um, until they can determine if and when they become a mother. And most of the patriarchal religions have as their core the control of women and reproduction. Um, that's often, I mean, I think that's sort of the point of, of, of most religions, is to control women. What do you say to uh, women who say, but we're very free and we have all the rights that we need, but you know, and we get that from our religion in a sense. So they're saying that there is freedom in religion for women. Uh, well, um, God, Allah, these are patriarchal concepts and abstracts. And as long as God is male, male is God. And uh, the Bible and the Quran set up a master slave relationship with God at the top and then man and then woman. And women are held in subjugation under uh, this doctrine. And uh, any freedoms that women have won have been in spite of the Bible, in spite of the Quran, not because of it. It's women who have moved religion forward, not the other way around. But what sort of constraints do you see needed for religion in order to help ensure women have rights and equality? Uh, but secularism would demand that there should be no religion, no doctrine, no dogma in our civil and secular laws. So, of course, we're, I'm anti-theocratic um, and pro-secular uh, government and, uh, you know, ideas held on faith for which there is no evidence or proof should not be in our laws, whether it's creationism or the idea that uh, there's a a human person at conception, uh, that there's an installment at conception, which is the basis for opposing uh, contraception and abortion, for example. And we just see these casual references in, in the holy texts to covering women that are now giving us uh, burqas, uh, which I think are such a, a terrible symbol of being trapped by religion. Um, circumscribing one's life. It's frightening to me to see women in burqas. Do you think women have a special and an added need to be free from religion? Well, yeah, because religion is, is a male, male religion. Um, with, uh, uh, women cannot be free, I think, while there is religious patriarchal law, law governing our lives. And the history of the women's movement in the West has been the history of um, fighting religion, speaking out in public, although the Bible says you have to be in silence, demanding the right to 
uh, own property, um, to control of our own children, uh, um, to be able to attend universities. All of these reforms in the Western world were vociferously opposed by the churches. It would, they, they were the enemy of the right to vote. And, and they are the enemy of women's right to ownership of our own bodies. And we are seeing the same kind of movement now in the Muslim world with women replaying this um, emancipation from religion, having to fight these strictures. And uh, I wish that we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but it's uh, to the great credit of um, women like uh, Taslima Najrin you, um, Ayan Hussi Ali, and all the other women who are speaking out against the Muslim religion um, at, at the threat of death uh, for their rights. Do you um, see any links between the movements for women freeing themselves from Islam to women freeing themselves from Christianity's rules? And uh, do you see that as universal? Yes, it's universal. It's exactly the same fight. And in fact, the um, Muslim, Christian, and Judaic religions share uh, the same uh, Old Testament uh, texts in common. The Abrahamic religions have a core, common core. So many of the, you know, we see um, what happened to Farhunda. Um, it reminded me of the passage of uh, what happened to Jezebel in the Bible, almost word for word, the same kind of... Uh, obscene violence against women for being seen as um, speaking out. In Fahunda's case, um, you know, reproving an imam. How dare she? Um, when we see women stoned to death, that's right out of the Old Testament. Christians forget that, that they share this in common. You know, there are some that will say uh, women's rights that you fought for are Western, they're not universal. What would your response be to that? Um, I agree with you that these are universal rights, um, these are human rights and civil liberties, and um, um, it, it isn't a, a culture that can impose oppression. It isn't a cultural right to deny uh, the right to you know, life, liberty, education, um, freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of expression to women because of religion. That's um, dictatorship that's uh, uh, just totally unacceptable. Uh, women's rights are human rights. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Annie Laurie Gaylor. I mean, I think she raises some really important points with regards to religion and women's rights. And I think uh, particularly because there is, especially when it comes to Islam, we often find it very difficult for women's rights campaigners to criticize Islam because we're often told that it's Islamophobic, it's bigotry, it's discriminatory. Whereas in fact, you know, the women's liberation movement, one of its biggest uh, challenges was uh, its challenge to religion. And a lot of rights that women have won along the way has been rights that have been just you know, forcibly taken from religion, in a sense, by pushing religion out of the public space. And I think Annie Geller uh, talks about that really well. And I, I, you know, I mean, I mean, that's the thing that uh, you could see very clear, clear similarities. And um, to give that narrative and create that space that it's um, right to and correct to criticize religion and is impossible, actually, and slightest liberation and change in, in human's life, in particular uh, women's life, any, of, in any society, it's impossible to achieve it without criticizing uh, religion and be against religion. And we could, we could see this in, and people need to recognize this, recognize um, not only Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and any other uh, religion, you know, that's, that's the space needs to be created. Yeah, I mean, I think religion is definitely bad news for women. I mean, obviously, there are many believers who are pro-women's rights and equality. I mean, we just talked about the campaign in Iran of men defending their wives and defending women's equality. Some of those people may be Muslims, but the reality is that, you know, if you want to defend equality, you do have to question religious rules and laws.
Yeah, absolutely, because the, the banner of all religion is misogynist. It's controlling, controlling of women's body and women's life. And you, you, you cannot criticize, you know, have any, any, any progress without criticizing religion. But we need to protect people. That's the key. Yeah, definitely. And, and it's interesting because I think it was um, Ina Shevchenko who had said that women in particular need to be against gods because they have the, uh, the special need for it. I think everyone needs to be against gods, but particularly women. And I think Annie uh, raises some important points in, in why it's important for women to do that. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. Please don't forget to uh, continue your, uh, sending us your comments and um, uh, spreading our program across the internet and social media. And that brings us to the end of the program. And from me and Mariam, until next week, goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.